Hello everyone and welcome to the live streaming of the Future Orchard Walks in Tasmania. We're really glad that you can join us online today. It's not quite the same as being there in person, but the good thing is that we've got the technology that enables us to connect and we can still share information and ideas. We also have the opportunity to see some leading orchards from New Zealand without leaving the country. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Rose Daniel and I'm the technical manager with APAL. The theme for this round of future orchard walks is the future is now. During today's orchard walk, you'll be hearing from Ross Wilson. He'll provide a quick update on the PIPS2 projects. Dr. Nigel Swartz from TIA, who will provide a summary on the outcomes from the PIPS2 fertigation research project and present the Sonata tool. Steve Spark from AgFirst, who will explore current and future issues, including labor, trees, quality, climate, and technology and Sophie Folder, the FLA for Tasmania, who will provide an update on the latest trials that she's been running. After the presentation, Steve and Ross will take us on a virtual tour of several leading New Zealand orchards, discussing the pros and cons of different systems and demonstrating the latest critical winter tasks, particularly winter pruning. And before we, before we get to our guest presenters, I quickly wanted to run through some of the activities that have been happening uh, within APAL over the last few months. As you're probably aware, much of southeastern Australia was affected by bushfires over the last summer, and APAL has been involved in assessing damage and preparing a submission to government to support recovery. New South Wales announced funding support around four weeks ago, and earlier this week, the federal government has also announced a support package for affected growers. If you'd like more information on that, please contact us at the APAL office, and, and we'll um, share that with you. In May, APEL staff have been trained in the Emergency Plant Pest Response Team by Plant Health Australia, and we're currently developing a standard operating procedure to make sure that the industry is better prepared in the event of an exotic plant pest entering Australia. And leading on from those two points, um, we have realised that these type of emergencies um, have made us more aware of understanding what constitutes the apple and pear industry and a tree census pilot study has commenced so that we have a better understanding and a better idea of how many trees and orchards uh, we have and where they are located so that we're more prepared to respond to these emergencies in the future. There's also been a lot happening in the future business space. The future business team are continuing to collect insurance related data to understand how much businesses are paying for insurance and what type of coverage is being assessed. Um, there's also a new a series of podcasts that have just been made available on the APAL website about the future business and um, DMG. And if you'd like more information about this, please get in touch with Rochelle Zealy, the future business manager. You can see her email address just at the end of point four there. And finally, we value any feedback that you have about the Future Orchards program so that we can continue to make sure that we're providing relevant content for you. Okay, so now without further ado, I would like to introduce our first two speakers to kick off the session. So the first um, presentation will be by Ross Wilson, who most of you already know. Um, he's a founding member of Ag First in New Zealand and brings over 30 years horticultural experience to the business. A grower in his own right, Ross has frontline experience with the issues faced by orchardists. Grower education is a passion and Ross is a key, dr a key driver of APAL's Future Orchards program. He regularly leads field days for various projects, ensuring that the latest technical advances and good tree management techniques make it to the hands of growers. Just quickly following on from Ross, you'll hear from Nigel Swartz, who I'm sure many of you know. He's a research fellow at the Tasmania Institute of Ad Agriculture at the University of Tasmania, and his research expertise is in the field of tree physiology and specifically tree crop nutrition. Nigel leads the fertigation project for the PIPS2 program that's funded by the Apple and Pear Levy, and he'll present outcomes from his group's research on improved water and nutrient use efficiency for apple, apple orcharding and the Sonata tool. So over to you, Ross. Yeah, welcome everybody. Let's get into it. So a quick PIPS2 update, and the reason why it's quick is that uh, we've got the uh, ability to have Nigel Swartz, your local researcher, present to both the North and Southern Loop. Um, and Nigel's got some really interesting stuff on his project. So I'm gonna keep this other project nice and quick. Um, and just to remind you, PIPS, the PIPS2 R&D project is coming to a close, um, but the PIPS3 program 
which is a consortium of, of R&D projects with researchers working together, is in the pipeline and will be announced soon. PIPS2 project had a number of uh, components to it. Uh, one of them was the ASE study done by Dr. Sally Bowne, and I see Sally's on today. Welcome, Sally. Um, and the peer laboratory work that was done by Dr. Ian Goodwin, they are both finished, and those results were previously disseminated uh, through Future Orchards, but through other mechanisms as well. The cotton moth biological control using Mastris, which is a an introduced immigrant to uh, Australia, led by Dr. David Williams, is ongoing. And today, in my five minutes, I'll give you an update of where that project's at. Uh, as I mentioned, the water and nutrient R&D led by Nigel is to be presented by Nigel himself. Always better to get it directly from the researcher's mouth rather than, uh, rather than via um, a second person. So great to have Nigel on board today. And then finally, a big biennial bearing study, uh, which is coming to a close, will be presented by Dr. Dario Stefanelli in our September 2020 Orchard Walk. And let's hope that one's in person, although the way this virus is going at the moment, uh, it looks doubtful, but we're hoping we'll be there in person in September 2020. So just an update on the Mastris release. Uh, the table on the left shows the release of this particular bio uh, control agent throughout Australia. Um, and you'll see there that it was released in Tasmania at Grove uh, back in 2017 in reasonably large numbers. What uh, David and his team have found is that the impact on the codlin moth population in year one has been very good and that there has been very good control. What they haven't been able to prove is that Mastris has become established from season to season. And that's, uh, and that's proving to be quite difficult in that uh, to be able to track Mastris requires uh, either the codlin moth to, a, to emit a detectable pheromone which they haven't been able to achieve yet with their lab cultured cotton moth. Um, and they're getting this ambigu ambiguous response uh, from the mastress itself to the cotton moth aggregation pheromone. So it, it's a lot of uh, scientific work there, and it's probably a bit difficult for uh, me and the growers to understand, but suffice to say, these little guys are quite hard to track and monitor. What David has said though is based on the Californian experience, remember this particular biological control agent has been released in multiple countries around the world and the, um, the success in other countries would gives him uh, good confidence that Mastris probably, uh, the probability is very high that it's become established. So watch this space. Another piece of work they're doing is the impact of uh, the chemistry that we use on, in this case, Mastris. So uh, as you can see, the table on the right, red is, uh, is very toxic. So you can see a couple of insecticides they've tested. These are laboratory tests. Uh, Avatar and Samurai basically killed Mastris. So highly toxic. But the other interesting thing is that even some of the common fungicides that we use, Chorus, Xyran, Dithane, Rubigan, um, had an impact on the fertility of the mastris. So, um, you know, it, it, what this sort of work shows you, and I, and I believe in, in integrated pest and disease management going forward, is as growers, you've got to have extremely good information on not only what the chemistry that you're using has on your, on your target pests, but also on all the biological agents that are in your orchard that can do a phenomenally good job of controlling pests, but we've got to be able to look after them. And some of the chemistry that we use does disrupt them, um, you know, significantly as shown in this work. Uh, another resource that the entomology team uh, throughout Australia, not just entomology, pathology as well, uh, put this Australian Appleham Pear 
integrated pest and disease management website together, which you can see the, uh, the, the site there. If you copy that out of the presentation and put it into your web browser, this website will come up. I've had a look. It's a very good resource, and we'd encourage you all to use it. Where to next? The little photo on the left there is, uh, is, is exactly what this mattress looks like. That's a blown up photo. It's a lot smaller than that. It's probably only uh, three to four millimetres long. But um, the next step for the program is they, they need to try and develop a pheromone trap that will monitor mattress establishment. Uh, they need to improve or try to improve the genetic diversity of the mattress culture. Remember, this guy has been reared in a laboratory. So uh, to try and improve the genetic diversity, to continue the pesticide testing, to provide data on current pesticides. And I, I think the goal is there uh, maybe to look at the, at the impact of pesticides, not only on mattress, but on, on other biologicals as well, uh, something like Aphelinus mali. Um, and then another really interesting piece of work um, that I think is uh, to incorporate into our orchards suitable nectar producing plants that are able to improve the survival of these biocontrol agents of which mastrus is just one. And with that, I'll end Rose and pass over to Nigel. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to be here and, uh, and talk to you about our, um, our tree nutrition work. And uh, thanks for, you know, it's nice to be in the home, my home state as well and, uh, and be talking to you about some of the things that I think I, I might have presented a little bit before. And it's certainly some of the conversations I've had um, with you growers uh, early on uh, when, when this project started. And now it's kind of we're at that end of that three to four year uh, project period. And, and we can kind of talk about what we've learned from, our, from, our, from that project and, and what the outputs of that project are going to look like. Uh, so essentially, um, what I want to talk to you about is, is our apple tree nutrition work, which is part of the PIPS program. Uh, PIPS stands for Productivity, Irrigation, Pests and Soils. And essentially, the fertigation work or the nitrogen, uh, come, the nitrogen work that we've been doing comes under uh, that sort of irrigation soils banner. And, uh, and as Ross said, this is the, sort of coming to the end of the second round. And, uh, and hopefully, in the, the next sort of few years, we'll be able to take on and, and move on for the, the, the next round. And uh, look, this is certainly not, not my work or not only my work. Um, the brain trust behind this Sonata tool that I'll be talking to you about this morning is uh, Steve Green from Plant and Food Research. Uh, he's sort of taken all that, the work that we've done over the last three or four years and, and turned that into uh, something that we can try and make sense of and, and, and have in front of us. Uh, Marcus Hardy, um, I saw a scientist at TIA has uh, really helped us really try and grasp all the different soils uh, that the apple, uh, apple growers across the country grow their trees in. Uh, PhD student B Zeng Tan uh, has done all of the nitrogen work that we're going to be presenting in this, in this project. And, um, and it's a real privilege to be able to present some of the, uh, the tree 15N work that, that b has been doing. And then, of course, um, uh, Professor Dougal Close has been um, our research project supervisor as well. So this, uh, this tool that we're talking about here is, um, uh, is a, a, okay, based on, the, on, on a model. And that, that tool stands for, uh, well, the tool is Sonata, and it stands for Strategic Irrigation and Nitrogen Assessment Tool for Apples. And essentially, Sonata is a, is a strategic decision support tool that will guide advisors and growers on the optimization of irrigation and nitrogen application for each of the major apple growing regions across Australia. So it's really about, it's a, really about a, con, it's a conversation starter. It's about not a necessarily a, a real-time decision support tool, but rather a strategic um, utilization of resources tool. So the purpose of Sonata is where all the focus is really try to understand water use and uh, fertilizer application, particularly in the context of nitrogen. Um, and we think about types, rates, and timings, and how they can be managed to satisfy tree demand. And um, obviously, we want to be mitigating leaching, we're going to be optimizing um, productivity without a cost to, to fruit quality. And um, the really interesting thing about this tool is that the tool requires climate and soil data from your local region 
Um, and then it also requires information from, from the growers or advisors or the users about the tree varieties that you're growing, um, your, your yields, your expected yields, or your anticipated yields, and various aspects of management. But there is a whole stack of background that, that's got to go into that tool. And I just want to um, glance over that, that briefly because um, that's really important to understand like, the physiology of an apple tree and also um, what has actually gone into uh, this tool and why this tool actually makes sense. So obviously we're in that um, sort of winter period at the moment where um, an apple tree, and here's a picture on the left, uh, the leaves are, are, are pretty much 100% fallen off or about to fall off at the moment. And at this time, all the nitrogen that, that was in those leaves have been withdrawn into storage organs, the branches, the, the trunks and the roots that sit there over the, over the winter period. And so that, that winter storage uh, then is remobilized in spring for those first two months of, of early spring growth. So that, you know, the flowering, um, the, the early green flush of leaves. And we know that that, that remobilized resource of nitrogen provides that nitrogen demand, meets that tree's de nitrogen demand until about four weeks after full bloom. And so at about four weeks after full bloom, then you know, the roots are starting to active, the soil's warmer, and that's particularly relevant for Tassie where um, all of a sudden root, up, start, root uptake of nitrogen can start happening. Then that occurs throughout the whole season. So then that puts in context this little chart at the top right here. And essentially this little chart is a, a chart about nitrogen use efficiency. So this is the amount of nitrogen that are in the apples and that gets removed um, by the crop uh, at harvest every season, plus the amount of nitrogen that the tree needs to grow for the season relative to the amount of nitrogen that gets put on as fertilizer. So like we know that obviously the sources of nitrogen for tree growth come from internal nitrogen recycling from, from storage reserves. It comes from the, the mineralization of nitrogen in the soil. So this is the natural conversion of organic nitrogen into a, a, a nitrogen form that the trees can use. And then the balance is made up of the nitrogen that gets applied as fertilizer. And obviously the point of this, this, this work is really trying to optimize that not the efficiency of that nitrogen use. And, and look, whether that's a synthetic form of fertilizer or whether that's a, a, an organic, a, a sustainable form of nitrogen, um, the, the, the nitrogen is the story that we're talking about here. And, and we're advocating for a, a, a much more reduced um, portion of synthetic, particularly synthetic fertilizer to, to really meet tree demand. And we know that through our nitrogen research work, we can, we've been able to optimize our, our nitrogen delivery to, to, to achieve that. Then the other story about um, resources is, of course, your water use. And, and um, I mean, this is a, a really relevant to the, to the rest of mainland Australia. We've had some great conversations around um, not necessarily just how much water a tree uses, but the availability of water in the first place. And, uh, and so we have been able to measure how much water a tree uses using SatFlow technology. And um, SAPFLOW, is just a, we use a heat pulse method and it essentially tracks the amount of water um, used by the tree via transpiration. And we've looked at that in, uh, in one to three-year-old trees. Um, we actually had a really good conversation at the start of this, this work with, uh, with Johnny Evans and, uh, and Scotty Price and, and they highly recommended us spending some time thinking about how much water does a, tr a one-year-old tree use, a tree use, a tree that doesn't have a crop on it, and then all of a sudden to a three-year-old, four-year-old tree that's got a crop. And what is, that, what, what is that difference over time? So we've done that. And then we've also looked at how much water, a, you know, a, a, a mature tree, eight to nine years old, yielding 70 to 80 tonnes a hectare is using as well over the course of a season. Okay, so this is work that was done by B. Um, this is really about trying to understand that the dynamics of nitrogen over the course of the season. So... Uh, B set up for his PhD uh, these really great uh, 15N trials. So these are trials that look at the, the, the tracing of, of, a, of a 15N, so if it's a stable isotope of nitrogen that, that gets um, delivered as you would normally deliver a fertilizer through a fertigation system. So B set up treatments that was 100% pre-harvest rate using 50 units a hectare. He did a 50-50 split, which is the, the gray line here, and then he did 100% um, post-harvest only. And essentially, we B set those trials up to really look at the efficiency of that nitrogen use over the course of a season. And so 
what this chart here on the left shows is the total N that's in the leaf lamina of the, of the apple tree. So this is the total N, this is the nitrogen concentration in the tree. And you can really see the response to 100%, so a 50 units a hectare rate um, at the start of the season. So this is four weeks after full bloom. We know that the tree is, is, uh, is ready to go at that stage with root uptake. And, um, and you can really see that response. And that's quite a different response to, say, the, treat, the half rate treatment and also the, the uh, zero end treatment control. And uh, that actually gave the tree a, a quite a, a bit of a head start in, in terms of nitrogen concentration. But what I want to draw your attention to is about week 19, when this actually, the, at this point, the fruit came off the tree at harvest. And we can really see a, a reallocation of nitrogen from the, uh, the fruit um, back into the leaves. And you can really see that, uh, that there was a, a spike for all treatments at this, at this analytical point here. And then nitrogen, con nitrogen concentration continued to drop until you know, week 22, 23, which is leaf fall, which is what we'd expect. Um, but then what I do want to draw your attention to is that, you know, that the, the significant difference between nitrogen applications really was minimized by the time we got to sort of fifth, week 15, week 16 um, after fertigation event. And this chart here on the right shows exactly how much nitrogen from fertilizer was contained in the tree. And this is where you really see a treatment uh, effect, a treatment difference effect. And, and you can see here that the summer, so this is, uh, no, sorry, this is the spring, 100% um, pre-harvest treatment only. Uh, we can really see that, that this has had a, a much greater portion of nitrogen from fertilizer compared to the 50-50 split and also the post-harvest only. So this post-harvest only treatment is what we thought was really interesting in that, in that at week sort of 19, 20, after the, the fruit came off the tree, that nitrogen was delivered, was delivered you know, once a week for, for three or four weeks and you know, starting mid, these, we're working on a gala tree, so we're starting about mid-March and uh, we can really see the limited uptake of that post-harvest uh, nitrogen application. And, and that really gives us some idea about how efficient um, that use of that nitrogen actually is or inefficient that use of nitrogen actually is. So then um, what's also really important for us to know is how that nitrogen gets partitioned throughout the whole tree. And, and this is really important for the tool because it helps us know exactly how much fertilizer N actually makes its way into the tree or makes its way into the storage organs. So this pie chart on the left is the pre-harvest. So this was the 100% pre-harvest only. And the chart on the right is the post-harvest. So this is, the, this is after the fruit had, gone off the, had been taken off the tree, we delivered our nitrogen. And so what we can really see is that, is that the big difference in the actual amount of nitrogen. So this is the amount of nitrogen that was recovered in the whole tree. So I should just mention that um, at dormancy, this is at, measured at winter dormancy, B excavated the whole tree, split the whole tree up into its various organs, and then added back in uh, the numbers associated with the fruit. And so, of course, there's, there's no numbers associated with the fruit with the post-harvest only application. But what I want to draw your attention to is I was a, a 9.7 grams of N per tree were recovered. So this is 9.7 grams of fertilizer N compared to 5.3 grams of N per tree post-harvest. So there's a, a much greater nitrogen use efficiency with a pre-harvest application compared to a post-harvest. But where did all that nitrogen go? Well, we can really see that uh, a very strong sink for nitrogen in the green um, portion of the pie chart here, which made its way into the fruit. Now, this is, uh, you know, this is not, I mean, this is not surprising. I mean, we kind of expect that. We know that on an 80 to 90 tonne hectare crop, um, that fruit is going to really demand a lot of nitrogen. And, and so the risk there in, there is in for pre-harvest application is that we might be having an impact on fruit quality. And so one of the big issues there is, is you know, are we going to get softer fruit or is the fruit going to delay ripening? Is it going to colour up enough if we put a portion of, of pre-harvest nitrogen on? Well, B also did fruit quality data over two years to check whether that might be the case. And B actually found that there was no significant difference in fruit quality at all, nothing, nothing that, that really got us concerned about a pre-harvest application. But what I also want to mention is that B's pre-harvest application is I mean, it was 50 units a hectare, but what we've discovered is that we don't really need to be putting that much on. I mean, we, we are advocating for a, a low rate um, 
you know, frequently applied uh, for you know that five to six weeks, four weeks after full bloom, and that's probably all the trees need. Um, you know, that's depend making sure that you know, your other baseline nutrition is 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 um, is the same using you know thinking about potassium and nitrogen and uh, and phosphorus etc. But I really want to draw your attention to the nitrogen that's actually in storage from your pre-harvest. So you know, the assumption is, well, we do a post-harvest nitrogen to build storage reserves into our, into our um, perennial organs. But what our pre-harvest applications are actually doing is the same thing. So you know, here we go. Here we've got you know, in the blue portion of the pie chart here, 14.7 grams of N, or 14.7% of 9.7 has made its way into the, the root. And then, you know, that's fairly comparable to 41.3% of 5.3 grams. And so a similar story there is for, is for the other perennial storage organ trunk. So, our, you know, the main take-home message from this is that we can actually achieve um, nitrogen allocation to storage and good, good, good fruit quality outcomes with a pre-harvest low rate application. Okay, so... That is relevant because we need to be able to use that information to, to make some sort of predictions about what an apple tree across the country is going to, how it's going to use nitrogen. So here is what um, the model or the tool actually, how, how it actually models um, the nitrogen use or the nitrogen in the tree. And you can see, and this is based on a, on a growing degree day, um, days after bud burst, and we can see the leaf nitrogen content uh, modeled here. So here's the modeled line, the, the dotted line, and here are actual numbers. And the same thing again for fruit as well. We know we can now predict exactly how much nitrogen is going to be at the fruit at various times of the season. And then for different varieties or for different regions, we can recalculate that, rescale that using a growing degree day function. Okay, so obviously then the next story there is, is water. Um, we, know, uh, we know from sap flow data that we, we can um, we know exactly how much water a two-year-old apple tree is using, for example, versus a, a three-year-old apple tree. And just out of interest, I mean, these are trees that uh, that we've um, uh, these are jazz trees in um, at Lucaston, uh, managed by um, uh, Andrew Matt Griggs, and we can really see that uh, you know at that sort of height of summer, we're using somewhere between five to six liters a day on a on a hot day, and you can see the the ups and downs here. Um, are, are reflective of the climatic conditions at the site at the time. So whether it's a hot, windy day, or a, or a, a, a you know, a coolish, um, you know, or a, a humid, uh, damp day, you can really see water, tree water use decreasing. And so yeah, you, know, you can see that scaled right up when we get to a three-year-old tree, where sort of we're hovering around eight to nine liters per day, as you know, and a three-year-old trees are already starting to have a crop on on the tree as well. And so this is calculated with a whole stack of really interesting um, mathematical formulas that's been established by um, Steve Green. It's essentially a, an empirical crop factor, KC, which is related to the leaf area index of the, of the tree canopy in the orchard. And so Steve has been able to model exactly how much nitrogen, uh, sorry, how much water a, a, a tree, depending on its age, is going to be using and depending on the crop, uh, that, a crop load that the tree is going to have. Okay, so this is where we draw in the understanding of, of what, of where and how the tree is being grown. So, so this is the, the, the soil characterization work that Marcus did. And Marcus and, and Garth worked really hard on this, going to four different regions across the country and uh, digging big trenches in growers' orchards. And uh, essentially, um, you know, they, looked, they did some, some soil characterization work, looking at the morphology of the soil. So... Um, soil profile descriptions that um, from zero to, to uh, about a metre. Then at, at each of these different profiles, they took soil chemistry data. Uh, and then the really important work was the hydrology work. So um, that we, Marcus now has a really good understanding of how much water, um, 31 different um, soil types across the country, uh, the, how much water these soil types use, um, how much water these soils can hold, and, and then some of the, the really important values around um, irrigation set points uh, that, uh, come, that appear into the, the tool a bit later on. The Marcus, with his um, extensive knowledge on, on, on all these three factors, um, has made some recommendations for how these soils can be managed 
to get the most out of out of the soils and correct any of the issues that that might actually be in these soils and all this information actually has made its way into the back of the back of the tool so you know, here's a sheet that is, is a screenshot of the sheet that that's in the tool the excel tool that you can't actually see but uh, essentially the tool comes preloaded with the range of soils from across the apple growing regions in the country you, there's a pull down menu that you'll be that is used to select your your soil series and and for example here we are down here on the left is the you know seven or eight different options that you'll have for tasmanian soils and um particularly with a focus down in the, the hewan and the derwent valley area and um and you, you know that then brings up a whole stack of, of, of data here that then goes into the tool um, in the background. Um, now, if you want information on what your soil looks like, um, that we, Marcus has we put all that data into a the www.applesoils.com website uh, that sits on the APAL website, which Larissa will share down the track, and um, and you can then you know you can then have a look and see exactly what your soil type. Um, should be looking like or could be looking like for for then choosing that particular soil type for the tool. Um, and then of course, you know, it's really important for us to make sure that we get our climate conditions right, and that'll be more evident to you down the track. And and so, you know, 22 climate stations from across the country have been um, accessed uh, from the Bureau of Meteorology database and records of ETO, air temperature, rainfall um, at, at various times of of, of the season. Um, from to that, from you know, over the last 18 to 20 years, have been downloaded, and this you know, sheet is obviously hidden again. But all this information sits there in the background and is used to drive the outputs of the tool. Um, so this sheet, yeah, this sheet is hidden, but you get the idea. Uh, and then you you select the climate that that you're actually growing your apples in. And so for us to be able to really understand exactly how this nest then applies to the crop load or your anticipated crop load or or an expected crop load, um, we've utilised the uh, Hort Innovation um, database of, that's been managed by Ag First as part of the Future Orchards and Focus Orchards um, uh, work over the last seven or eight years. And that database is called OrchardNet. And essentially growers who are really interested in these sort of things can, can plug in all their data, all their, their yield data, their phenology data, um, their tree age data, and it gives us a into OrchardNet, and we've downloaded all that information. It gives us a bit of an understanding about how different apple trees operate um, at different ages and grown in different regions. So here's all the pooled data for Granny Smith over the last you know, seven to eight years, um, which gives us an understanding that you know at about ten years old, a Granny Smith um, is yielding about seventy-five to eighty tons a hectare. Whereas, say for Pink Lady, for example, we know that you know at about seven to eight years old, we're we're peaking in our yields at about seventy-five to eighty ton a hectare as well for pinks. Now, this information goes into the backbone of the tool as well, and um, curves are fitted to this to derive an age relationship for yield with a you know an upper and a and an average quartile. And so, you know, one of the issues obviously is that we're relying on data that's in OrchardNet and. We've got really solid data on four varieties, but you know, the more data we can get on some of these newer varieties as well is really important for us. Okay, so then this is what the you know, this is the front end of the tool. This is what the tool is going to look like, and uh, you know, this is you know, at the moment. You know, it's obviously it's really hard. I'd much rather be sitting there in front of you with Excel open, and we can be mucking around and putting in all different scenarios and stuff. But you know. I only got sort of five, 10 minutes left. So I just want to give you a bit of a, an overview, a snapshot of what uh, the tool is actually going to look like. So essentially this is the front end. You um, will identify what, what variety you're growing, how old that tree is, your tree spacing and your bro spacing. Um, that's really important for us to extrapolate that out on a per hectare basis. Then we really need to know whether you've got a micro jet system or a dripper system. It's you know, the rate of that system, um, emitter spacing, the duration of your irrigation applications, and then your return period as well. And then you have the option of whether you want to see this um, in a megalitre per hectare perspective or, or millimetres, depending on what you, how you understand that better. And then this, this box on the left um, is really important because this gives you some numbers to work with. So we're estimating that um, the root depth of those trees are down at about 
92 centimetres, and this is work that, that sort of has been achieved from Marcus. We've got a, a drought tolerance factor. Um, and, that, and then what's also really important for us to know is what kind of yields we're expecting from this variety at this age with this row and, and, and plant spacing. And uh, so in this scenario here, we've got an expectation that we're at about 61 tonnes a hectare. And that's really important because that helps us know exactly how much nitrogen is going to be pulled off um, or estimate how much nitrogen is going to be pulled off every time or whenever you remove your crop at harvest. So, for example, in this scenario, we're looking at about 26 units a hectare uh, of nitrogen that's getting pulled off when you, when you harvest your 61 tonnes a hectare. And then... We also know that for this variety, it requires about 30 units a hectare for um, seasonal uh, leaf and, and new canopy growth. And so these numbers here are, are sort of our nitrogen requirements for the season. And then uh, when, because you've already selected your, your climate and also your, your soil type, we also have some really important data on, on your soil. So this will tell us the fill capacity of your soil, your refill point, your wilting point, and the total available water for your, for your apple trees. And this, this sort of box here is really important for having conversations with your irrigation specialist, or if you guys know this, this information really well, um, you can use this to plot your, um, to set up your irrigation systems. So um, look, I, I wanna then draw, take you through to a, 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 this, you know, take you to a next step further of what this, um, you know, this demonstration is going to look like. So here's a worksheet from Sonata that um, you know, we've obviously selected the soil type and climate. Um, and we, we're using this worksheet to display the tree water use as a function of factors um, you know, associated with the variety and age and planting density of the orchard. So for example, um, if we're growing our pink ladies in grove uh, on a, on a Lucaston grey curacao type soil, we can, we've got an estimation that you know, in the peak of summer, we're using somewhere between, you know, 25 to 30 litres a hectare of, of oh, sorry, litres per day. Um, that's how much your tree water use is. And that sort of drops, obviously, um, to, to nothing around uh, June, July, August and ramps back up again as the canopy builds. And then, you know, we also know that over an annual season, you, we average about 754 mils and the requirement to meet your tree water balance is about 87 millimetres. And so this, this information here on, on the right is, a, is, is a, a root zone soil water content. And, and this is, you know, if you guys have a good understanding of this or, or um, is a, a good, this is a good conversation starter that you can have with your, your irrigation specialist to, to really make sure that you're matching your tree water demand uh, with the water that is, that is available through your irrigation system and, and, and from rainfall events. And this is sort of some evidence over the last five to six years of how that happens, how that can occur. So moving on, um, so that's the, so that, you know, that sheet first is sort of the annual um, perspective. Here is that broken down into what that's going to look like on a month by month basis. So Here's your um, expected ETO, so evapotranspiration um, uh, aspect of, the, of water. Um, so you know, that's, and then also then the rainfall that you get um, on a seasonal basis, on a month by month basis. So uh, you can really see, you know, this is, this is essentially how we understand rainfall in, in the Huon Valley area. Um, and then this is really showing us the tree water use and the irrigation in the red requirements to meet your water balance for that month. And then that's broken down here on a month by month basis or with a, a, on a number basis. So obviously there's some upper quartiles and, and some deviations there depending on, on, on your information, on, on your individual site. But you know, the more um, local, the, the more local, uh, locally relevant information we can get, the better. So what we've asked growers from across the country is if you, have um, historical uh, soil moisture data or historical climate records from, a, from a, a weather station that you've got on your site. We'd love to get that and we'd love to build that back into the tool because that's very simple then for you to be able to select uh, you know, your most locally relevant um, climate conditions or, or soil moisture data to, to make sense of your, your annual water or your monthly water balance. Um, 
look, this is you know, essentially what we're showing here is just a snapshot of what that, this tool is going to look like. There's a whole stack of other things that will go into this that, that haven't been 100% prepared yet. Um, and I really look forward to, you know, in the next few months, once the COVID restrictions um, ease a bit to be able to get in front of growers with your, with your advisors and be able to sit down and pour over this Excel sheet to, to run you through how to use it and, and what kind of information you can, you can best get from it, essentially. Um, so what we really want to know uh, from, from growers, from advisors, is what's important to you to assess. Um, it's really important for us to know uh, what kind of scenarios you'd like to think about here. Um, and, you know, and that could be around irrigation set points. So uh, what are your irrigation strategies? Uh, do you have a strategy where, um, for example, you need to build crop size at the end of the season and your, your main strategy for that is, is uh, piling on some water at, at the end there. And, uh, and, um, and then we, we can really try and get some sort of grasp on how much extra water is going to be required uh, to fulfill that requirement. And then, and then we can actually do some, some metrics around that. So what, what is our water use efficiency under those scenarios? And, and then whilst this may not be so relevant to Tassie, a cost benefit analysis of that extra water that's required to build that crop. So that's, I mean, that cost benefit analysis is certainly relevant to the rest of mainland Australia. So obviously there's some key knowledge gaps. Um, you know, it's really important for us to, I mean, at the moment we can only estimate root depth, um, but we'd love to get data on root depth and, and also what might be the impact of soil restriction. So uh, what other limitations are there? Is compaction a limitation for you in your orchard or, or is, you know, how big a deal is drainage in your orchard? So all, those, all these sorts of things are important and, and I'm looking forward to having conversations with, with each of you guys down the track. Um, Certainly feel free to get in touch with me uh, with any data you might have or any you know, concerns or any thoughts about you know, what kind of scenarios we could, we could play in, in this. Um, you know, you've, got my, you know, you've got my phone number, many of you, and you've got my uh, email address. Please don't hesitate to, to get in touch with me. Um, if you have any questions, uh, yeah, put, put them on the chat there and um, yeah, keen to have conversations. Thanks very much, Nigel. We do have our first question, which is great to see. If anyone else has any questions, don't forget there's the Q&A bubble tab down the bottom that you can click on and type in any questions that you've got. So, Nigel, the first question is, do you think that the training system, for example, a 2D system, would have an influence on the nitrogen usage and storage? Yeah, I mean, look, absolutely it would. Um, I, I think... I don't necessarily I don't think necessarily that it's about whether it's three dimensional or two dimensional. I certainly think it's really about the overarching canopy that you've got, um, because the more wood that you've got, the more nitrogen that that wood has to store, or oh, that nitrogen more nitrogen is going to be required. Um, but I certainly think there there might be uh, with regards to a two dimensional system that might be more efficient at at uh, absorbing light. So there's that sort of carbohydrate. Um, uh, allocation accumulation and, and nitrogen balance there which which could have a, a role to play in in the efficiency of nitrogen use um, and how much resource is required to to build your tree to get the kind of crop that you're expecting um, but certainly it's that and particularly with regards to the tool um, the tool is about how much canopy your tree's got with regards to how it allocates as how it allocates resource use Okay. Um, just, I know it's early days in your development of your model and the research data, but have you, have you seen any changes? In, obviously, you know, this is, this is make, um, some very new data and, and has implications for the way that people might apply nitrogen for, and the effects on fruit quality and, and so on. But have you seen any changes in the way that um, nitrogen is being applied in the orchard, orchard? Has anyone already started trying this at the commercial level? Yeah, look, I, I really think there is. I think when we're, there is a significant push and, uh, and uh, uh, understanding that we're, and in conversations I'm having with, with our, you know, the main advisors is that we're using a lot less nitrogen now than, than probably what we ever have. And, and I think we're using that through, you know, our fertigation systems, which are, most of the growers are, already have set up on their farms. That nitrogen is already being applied much more efficiently and uh, fruit quality outcomes are, are, are benefiting as a consequence. And how, how does that relate, Ross or Steve, how does that relate to the way that nitrogen's applied in New Zealand orchards? Um, 
You know, I think I think the one of the big differences we see is is different orchard blocks have very uh, they have very different organic matter statuses and their and their natural nitrogen levels are very different block to block. Um, and so we've got, you know, we'd have some orchards that where the, the natural nitrogen content, even the nitrogen that comes in in the irrigation water is actually reasonably substantial. Um, and if there's a good clover amount in the sward, you can, you know, it's actually surprising how much nitrogen is actually naturally available. And it's, it's up to the grower to understand where their trees are at. You know, we can see in the, just in the Hawke's Bay, we can see orchards that are grossly nitrogen deficient and then we can see orchards that are far too green at harvest and the fruit just doesn't color um, so it really is a matter of understanding where your blocks at and, and i would i'd recommend in addition to what nigel's been saying is a you know a, a really good monitoring system of either sap or leaf nitrogen so you really understand what what is happening on your block um, you know from the get-go Okay, we've got it. Thanks, Ross. We've got another question. Um, can Sonata allow you to access weather data that you know currently for the season rather than just um, district long-term averages? So using predictive rainfall forecasts and ET. Yeah, that, look, that's, that's an excellent question. And that's, that's where we're hoping to get to. Um, it can't do that yet. Uh, at the moment, we can only base our predictions, our, our model on, on, on the history. But our, our next phase of the project, which we've pitched, is to be able to access um, for bomb forecasting and uh, local local area forecasting to be able to to do that in real time. And uh, the you know, the real hope for this is to take it out of Excel. Um, I mean, it, it's going to be fairly user friendly as it is, but take it out of Excel, put it into an online format, online web app uh, that utilizes your your on farm soil data together with um, your 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 bomb predictive you know, week, uh, uh, 10 days in advance to be able to do real time um, irrigation um, scheduling. And just, just to go back to, I guess, what Ross just pointed out, how much information does a grower need to be collecting to get the most out of the model? Is obviously, you know, different orchards have different sensors and different monitoring systems and regimes. If, how sophisticated does that data collection need to be? Yeah, look, I, I mean, the yeah, it doesn't have to be that sophisticated. I mean, that that's the point of of that's the whole point of modelling essentially is that um, we've got collected sophisticated data from enough orchards so that we we can be fairly confident in, in what the model is predicting. Um, however, the the more sophisticated the data you've got, uh, the the more reliable we can we can say that uh, uh, how much water your trees are going to use or or how much um, water is going to be held in your soil, for example, and and what the consequence of irrigation and rainfall is going to be on your soil moisture. Um, so, yeah, look, uh, and, but also what, what would be great, and this is what we're, we're missing for, 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 for many varieties, is actually leaf nitrogen at different times of the season. And then what's the relationship between leaf nitrogen at different times of the season and then on your final fruit quality outcome. So you know, we want to be able to get to the point that we want to be able to say, and many of the, the advisors could probably do this already with their experience, but we want this to be able to be something that is really obvious in the tool that we're aiming for this sort of leaf nitrogen um, perspective to achieve these fruit quality outcomes and, and you're trying to understand if, if that relationship exists. So the more, the more nitrogen data that we can get uh, is only going to help, help matters, that's for sure. Um, thanks very much, Nigel. If anyone does have any data that they would like to share with Nigel or any other questions for Nigel, please follow up with him at TIA. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to receive any data that you've got to share and answer your questions. Okay, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Steve Spark, who will um, present The Future Orchard, where we are now and where we are going. Steve Spark is a consultant with AgFirst. He has over 20 years experience in pip fruit and kiwi fruit. Working with clients, he provides intensive orchard consultancies on orchard management, pruning, thinning, harvest management, and pest and disease management. Steve's strong financial management skills also provide financial planning and monitoring, budgeting, performance analysis, and purchase appraisal, appraisals for a range of clients. So over to you, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Rose. Um, I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with Nigel 
Um, interesting in New Zealand, uh, the more monitoring we've done on nutrition, the less nitrogen we're putting on. So um, yeah, that's the take home message for, for everybody. Um, my talk today is a joint collaboration with Jonathan Brooks on uh, what is the orchard excellence now and what's it likely to be in the future and what are our drivers, what are the things we've got to look forward to. Um, as you can see, um, future orchards in the last few years has highlighted lots of things. Um, in this presentation, I'll summarise just some of the areas for quality, climate, trees, labour and technology. To start off with uh, quality, as you all know, and we've done quite a few presentations on this in the past, and we've also done uh, demonstrations on uh, eating quality with your growers. But basically, we have to um, lift the quality or get the quality up and make sure it's a mindset for everyone. Um, quality can mean different things to different people, and that's fine, but for us, uh, we tend to chase premium markets, so we need to be top quality. To get that, we need to be closer to our consumers. Um, we need seamless information. We need to be listening to them. We need to be understanding. And I'll actually give you an example of that a bit later on with another industry doing exactly that. Uh, we need to then change and adjust their orchards. And it is pleasing under the futures orchards that uh, most Australian growers are changing the way they're, they're orcharding and are improving their fruit quality. Um, but as always, we've got to keep looking for continuous improvement. One way you can improve quality is change of varieties, and you've all um, seen the different varieties uh, that are on, uh, on available to you all. Um, they all come with their, their good points and their bad points, but you need to be in a variety club to take advantage of these uh, opportunities that are around. Um, the worst place you can be is looking over the fence at your neighbour and seeing that they have access to profitable varieties that you can't get your hands on. So yeah, making sure you know what's going on with varieties and keeping in tune with it. Most of the varieties have quality systems um, and they, uh, they put money into developing the varieties so that they can give some longevity to it. Um, the variety choice that's best for you, well that depends on your orchard and your location. Um, it depends on um, what system you're wanting to grow it on. Um, and how much energy you're going to put into it, and then understanding the risk and reward for any changes you do make. But at the end of the day, it pays to seize opportunities and try and minimise your mistakes with varieties. As we've said to you guys in, in before, is get your root stocks right, your planting density right, put a variety on, and don't worry if that variety doesn't make it. Um, it's pretty quick to regraft over and get a new variety going. But certainly do your homework. The other point I'll make is that with all varieties, and, and some of us want to hang on to the old varieties, um, the customer's always right. And we need to keep that to the foremost of our mind. Uh, what they want, uh, we have to give it to them. If we don't give it to them, someone else will. And that's the adage that New Zealand growers have adopted for some time. Uh, we export 75% uh, of all we produce in apples, and that's the only way we can keep relevant. Um, one of the advantages um, of having different varieties and too many of them in some respects is that supermarkets we see overseas are now um, coming to supplier groups in New Zealand saying, can you supply me this particular variety? Because if they can tie it up, then no other supermarket can supply it in their region or their area. And that means they can charge premiums over their, over their um, competitors, providing the variety is um, a good variety. The other area I'll talk about is managing climate. And you guys probably know more about it than we do, but um, until a few years ago, I, I would have said to you it's not an issue for us, but it has been an issue. And I've showed you slides of flooding and, and different things going on in New Zealand, in, in my patch particularly, that uh, we've never counted before. And we've got a really unusual uh, winter at the moment. Um, our winter chill units, if you took them from the 1st of um, June, uh, 1st of May, they are pretty much identical to the last four or five years. If you start the countdown from the 1st of June, we are 30% below our winter chill for the last four or five years. So what that's gonna do, we're not sure. Um, normally our winters, like you I would imagine, get colder after the shortest day. Um, therefore, I would expect um, some snow to come, but we haven't seen anything on the hills behind us at the moment. So the, the uh, climate is getting stranger. Uh, it's getting more risky and more volatile. Um, and we need to uh, be aware of it and try and farm around that. 
Um, and we've locally got plenty of examples of where we had flooding and that where the growers have changed the way that they set the new orchards up uh, to handle the flooding and the problems that uh, the extreme climate is throwing at us. So as with all climates, um, you know, and there's only so much you can do, had a comment from a West Australian grower saying maybe he felt he might be growing apples in the wrong uh, area and uh, only he can answer that but uh, you know if the climate isn't suitable for what you're growing then he may well be right we all have to make that decision over time um now a little bit want to sort of go forward a little bit and look at uh, what we saw in the futures orchards and where we're perhaps heading so these sorts of orchards were very common they still are in some areas um, but they're not going to be what's required uh, in the future in 2040. Um, we're going to need to keep looking at how we improve them. Um, we've all seen OrchardNet and um, understand how we can use that tool for monitoring block performance, um, keeping it up to date. Um, we talk about upgrading or planting new varieties at uh, between 5 and 15%. Um, if you drove around my patch at the moment, you would see a heap of Braeburn trees pulled out, a heap of um, Royal Gala trees pulled out, and lots of plastic down with sterilised soil ready for planting this spring with new varieties. So, um, and it's not one variety fits all, there's lots of varieties and people are going with their variety of choice. There's also an eye on how new technology um, and other issues going forward are gonna benefit us. And so plantings are based around how do we maximize the potential going forward. Labor and task management, that's gonna be a big one for us. Uh, up until last Friday, um, we had 3,000 RSCs or Islanders um, stuck in the country that couldn't get home. A thousand disappeared on Friday. The Air Force flew them back to the islands. Um, but we're looking at uh, ways on how we manage our labor and how we get the best from them. And these are some key points I'm just listing up here. Um, we need to look for continual improvement. We have a seasonal labor force. Uh, the question is, will it be back um, later in the season? Um, we don't know. Um, but we're trying to uh, get a handle around the bigger picture and the impact it's going to have on us. I mentioned the um, seasonal backpackers. Um, I mentioned the RSEs, um, the grey nomads for you guys. Um, all those people were floating around for, for um, labour options. Um, we're not sure we're going to have them at the moment. So it, where we are, um, we're overstocked with staff. Um, and we're busy trying to um, overdo jobs. We're trying to prune job, uh, do our pruning really well because we're not sure we're going to have these people there for hand thinning and even harvest times later on. So COVID-19 is certainly having a big impact. And um, even though we're well placed, it's still going to restrict the amount of backpackers and people in the country. Um, so growers are starting to um, get really concerned about how they're going to fulfill their labor requirements for this season. Shorter term options are um, often quite easy, but uh, the first thing we're doing with growers is we're creating plans. We're looking at their crop loads, so we've reviewed their um, yields from last year. We're now putting in place plans for what crops they want this year. We're looking at their vigor. Um, we're doing um, pruning uh, and thinning plans and harvest. And one of the um, observations there is that um, we're trying to do more work now, like I said, with pruning, so that we get fewer bud numbers. Now, one of the little tools we're using for this um, is the BCA, or branch cross-sectional area measure. We're working out how many fruit we will put on a branch, and then if it's something like Royal Gala, we will prune that branch to one and a half fruit buds for the number of fruits. So that's getting us more accurate and getting closer to our target. And there's a very good video, hopefully we'll see it today, on uh, the 2D system at Hotties where they're doing exactly that sort of system and they're pruning branches to 25 buds. Um, you've all been aware of how we've tried to simplify your, your rules and keeping it simple and um, none simpler than the pruning rules that we've introduced in the past. Uh, remove 12 o'clock, six o'clock, uh, keep branches long and skinny, no shortening up. There are all sorts of things coming. So we're continually refining those rules to try and achieve the ultimate, the better result, good fruit quality and uh, reduce our workload later on. Again, we measure and monitor um, performance, keep an eye on it. The other point I'll make is that if we do tasks early, um, it often makes it cheaper than later on. And, and many, many crops, a um, dollar spent for Christmas is $2 after Christmas. So um, do it wise, do it properly, 
do it, uh, do the do the right quality, and you'll find that um, it becomes cheaper in the long run. Longer term labour solutions are a little bit more complex and they involve a lot more uh, thought. Um, you can change varieties, and again, that that takes a wee while. There is new machines coming along. There's robotics, there's sensors, new sensors which um, Nigel talked about, but also we're doing more nitrate testing. Um, and, and the range of these sensors is going to increase dramatically. Um, the other issue is we're trying to reduce waste um, and make sure we're harvesting enough sunlight to turn it into um, productive fruit quality. Um, is changing the work habits, um, going more to platforms away from the ladders. And you've all heard um, Craig or Craig's analogy that climbing up and down a ladder is like uh, walking to base camp at Everest. Um, that can't continue and it won't continue. What we're finding with platforms is there's more people, um, more people willing to work on a platform than carrying ladders and therefore we're able to get more productive. You also have a better environment. Having said that, I've seen some platforms uh, which are powered by diesel motors or, and they're very noisy or lots of fumes. That isn't very conducive to uh, motivation as well for staff. Um, but certainly they offer a lot of opportunity and, and we've talked a bit about that in the past. Canopy design, well I suppose that's the exciting part. That's the bit that everyone's been uh, watching with bated breath around the world and there's lots of different structures. It really doesn't matter which structure you go with because um, with them all, you have to understand them. Uh, you have to make sure um, you know um, the ins and outs and, and what's, what's going to work and what's not. But once you do get one, try and stick with it. And uh, we've got plenty of examples in New Zealand of lots of different strategies, lots of different structures. But where we fall down is having too many on the one orchard. And staff find it difficult to switch from one growing canopy to another unless the rules are very simple. So there's a lot of standardization um, being planned in our orchards where we move to one system and then stay with it and make, maximize the opportunity with it. I think with most platforms, um, I, I'll carry on. Uh, technology, so new technology is coming. Um, the issues is, is it commercially available? We, we've bought in a lot of platforms from Italy. Uh, the downside is, is when they break down, we don't have any parts. Um, it's hard to get them serviced, so now there's more of a push coming from the US where it's a bit uh, easier to get parts for us um, and a bit more robust and we were able to do the servicing ourselves. Perhaps they're also less complicated machines too. Um, but we're, at the end of the day, we're focusing on efficiency um, and effectiveness and that's technology. Now, I've got lots of examples of um, where we're using technology, uh, such as in pack houses, we're putting one shed locally, put a $2 million defect grader in, um, and that's replaced uh, 25 to 30 staff that were on the grading tables. They now have moved further into the packing line, and he's put more packing lines in so that he can increase his productivity and his throughput by 50%, but he hasn't actually in increased his labor requirements. So often technology and uh, it's paid for by capital replaces labor. So that's the opportunity a lot of orchardists are looking at now. How can they put capital into these things and reduce their labor requirements? Because their understanding labor just isn't available to the same extent it was before. Um, yeah, basically it needs to be able to add value to your business. I suppose this next slide is a bit more futuristic um, and it's targeting what will an orchard look like in 2040? Um, why do we need to change? Um, there's several reasons for that. It's the health of the consumers. We need to be providing healthy fruit to the consumers. Um, we have social obligations to be a good employer um, and good um, in our communities. Otherwise, if our consumers find out, they won't be too happy with us. And it also needs to be sustainable. Now, I got told that this slide, I got suggested in one of the meetings that uh, this slide was more relevant to APAL and not so much to grass. Well, I just read out uh, from the newspaper last night, um, in my local newspaper, Frontier, as you may be aware, is probably the largest dairy co-op in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, as of June 2021, they will be paying 10 cents a kilo um, to farmers who meet their farm sustainability and values targets. And they go on to say that it's been driven by consumers and they don't want to lose out on the value that that will um, give in their supply chain. And if they don't, uh, so where's it going to be paid from? Well, the growers who don't meet those values and sustainability um, targets, it will come from them. So that's one example. In New Zealand, we have another example. Um, 
all orchards and all farms by 2025 have to have environmental plans in place and functioning. Um, so that, that's quite a demand. And in those environmental plans, it will cover water management and nutrient budgeting, plus all the other things such as being a social, a good uh, employer, and those sorts of things. So these things are coming and um, there's no way around it. We need to be aware of it. If you look at what's gonna be our focus, well, we're a strong uh, exporting country. Uh, we're looking at what our global customers are demanding, and those are some examples of it. You need to look at your local um, demands, but again, you guys export into the mainland. Um, but having said that, there's still the trends happening globally will also happen locally. It may just be a lag with it. But integrated systems, zero waste and taste and nutrition are gonna be um, more, more important for our consumers and our clients. So how are we going to do this? Well, we need to keep looking at uh, technology and innovation. And um, Nigel's mentioned one there with Sonata, but there's more tools and more things coming on. We as an industry need to keep looking at solutions and we need to learn and apply. The interesting thing about learn and apply is that um, my observations from uh, when we've been in the Futures Orchards throughout Australia was when we first started, there was a lot of reluctance to actually take on some of the new methods and some of the new things that we talked about. Um, since people have started trying some of these things, they're actually seeing that they work and therefore there's more willingness to learn and apply and have a go at these things. It also keeps younger uh, staff or younger family members motivated in the orchard and keeps them going. So all in all, um, if we don't change ourselves and move in this direction, uh, industry may demand it through leadership or as will come, the public will demand it and um, the one that we want to try and beat is the fact that the government will, will make a policy that will demand we do it. We're better to drive change than let ourselves be driven. So how will this all come together for us as orchardists? Well, there are four key areas that uh, the bulk of the research uh, around the world is, is happening, and it's in the sensing, data management, automation, and canopy design. So sensing, and we've heard of some sensors, again, with what Nigel's doing with Sonata. We've also heard of SAP sensors for water management. Uh, you guys are doing LEAF and, and all sorts of testing in your orchards. Um, that's going to continue, but it's going to get jazzed up a bit more with better sensing capability and capacity. Um, and no longer are we just going to rely on walking around an orchard and kicking the dirt or getting a spade out. We have our irrigation monitoring program, which is on the right there. But there'll just be a lot more sensors that will give us better timely information um, to help us make our decisions. Here's one uh, sensing tool that's uh, pretty much a commercial, just about a commercial stage now, and that's uh, flying a drone over your orchard. It uh, does a, um, a picture of your orchard and then the color graphs there on the right hand side, that shows um, the different colors show the vigor of the trees you then can get the sensor to download the information into your root pruner and your tractor, and the root pruner will go in and out automatically based on that um, plan and map that's been uh, drawn up by the um, drone. So that's interesting. So only the trees that need root pruning get root pruning, and that will even the orchard out and reduce the vigor. So these sorts of things are well on their way now. Data management, that's probably um, a, a, a quite a big one, and you might wonder why. Um, we here were testing um, a crop um, uh, estimation um, uh, piece of machinery that we towed behind the tractor that's been commercially available around the world and we've tested it for a few years. One of the interesting things was that uh, that involved a lot of uh, computers in the actual tractor cab. Um, so there's so much complex data being collected from these machines it then needs to be analysed and put into a decision model so that we can then use that and make some make the right decisions. So that's one of the areas where um, we need faster internet, we need it to go up into a cloud-based system and then we need to come back. Um, and so that's been one of the glitches with a lot of the new technologies, how the data is gonna be managed. There's a couple of examples below that, which I've got is um, OrchardNet and there's a, on the right-hand side is a non-commercial app that we currently use, one of my staff members Develop this, which is a fruit counting app. So it's just when they're out in the orchard, they use their phone, they add in the, the fruit numbers per tree or per limb, and then it all gets collated and sent back to the office where it can then be put into a report for the grower. These things are, are going to happen more and more. Automation, probably the bit that shows the most exciting bit, and we all like to see what's going on here. Um, the uh, VR virtual reality headsets up there, you might wonder where will they play a part? 
Well, we're currently working on a project um, where we can train people how to prune, how to thin trees by putting the VR headset on, um, develop the program, and they don't even have to go in the orchard. And we can um, work on their bad habits and correct them and make them develop good habits through the VR. So that's not new technology in regard to the headsets for gaming and all that, but we're taking that technology and using it in the orchard. Uh, platforms, there's a lot more use of platforms and harvest assist um, technology um, happening. And then there's also here um, the robotics. And I've just got a short video here. That machine is a robotic picking arm. Um, the damage from that was uh, comparable to a hand a harvester. Um, the idea is um, that they will put four or five of these picking arms onto a machine, shrink it down, make it smaller, and then uh, carry on picking orchards. But the orchards need to be simple and need to be able to handle this sort of technology. And again, that's the next part of the puzzle, which is orchard design. Lots of different things happening in that space. Um, here are four main examples which um, are shown, but it's, it's not the only examples. You have the vase shape or tatura trellis shape system. And there's also Washington V or the V type system. There's the fruiting walls on the right. Um, the FOP system from Tustin or Plant and Food, which is uh, fruiting walls um, with vertical wood. Um, that's new and taking place. Those rows are about two metres apart um, and reportedly aiming between 140 and 160 tonnes per hectare. We also have the 3,000 trees per hectare super spindle on the right, uh, which is also a narrow system. So the SNAP system we've talked about in the past is, is really important going forward for us. So varieties and cannabis need to meet our future needs. Um, we need to keep um, looking at how we can manage and, and mitigate our climate. Um, we've got to look at the quality that our customers are demanding. And as I mentioned before, we're from Terra. If we don't, someone else will. So therefore, um, the change is better to be driven by us. Um, production and profitability expectations. So some of these systems are very expensive to set up, but if they give you extra increases in yields and tonnage, then that's all well and good. But also many of these new systems lend themselves more favorably to these uh, labor um, saving devices and the new mechanization that's available. So the idea is to keep looking at systems which will give us an edge for when we can start to get this technology. Uh, you're already familiar with the plucker track and the different picking types of systems that have been around for some time, uh, but they do make picking a bit easier. Um, the middle ones here, which is, is really interesting, which is the um, uh, EM mappings of orchards. Um, so before we planted um, a big orchard in Nelson, we EM mapped it, um, and then it gives color, no different colors. So red is the lower area or can be different heavier soil types. Uh, so in the heavier soil types, we can space our trees out. In the lighter soils, we can move them closer. Uh, it also gave drainage maps. It can do nutrition maps. It can tell you the structure. It also gives us a really good place on where we can put our soil measure monitoring devices to capture the bulk of the soil. All sorts of things coming on like that. So your yeah, new, new technology is looking pretty exciting for us. And, and by 2040, there'll be a lot of really good options available. I suppose um, the, the key part uh, in, in all this is that uh, if we don't change the new technology, um, plenty of other people will, um, and, and we'll be left behind. And, and like I said, with Fonterra, that's, that's an example. If you don't change the sustainability, um, you, someone else will be paying for it. Um, as always, um, keep, keep your eyes and ears open and be prepared to come along and see what this new technology and these new canopies and that evolve to. This shot here that I'll close with is a fruiting wall um, that was on a standard five by three meter orchard. Um, we, there's a video on it to show you how we did it, but basically this fruiting wall replaced existing trees. It was very cheap and actually increased the yield significantly and gave a lot more quality fruit lower down the tree. So again, always plenty of options if we can uh, 
keep keep looking for them. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, you provided a lot of or, or identified a lot of um, interesting decision making points and provided a lot of thought provoking examples of what's happening in New Zealand. Um, we don't have any questions coming up just yet. Remember to type those into the Q&A bubble down the bottom of your screen. Um, in, your, in your opinion, what technology has had the greatest impact in, New in the New Zealand apple industry? You've obviously presented a lot of different types of technology in New Zealand. What's sort of, I don't know, making the biggest... I think what, what's going to have the biggest impact going forward is, is, the, is the planting simple, narrow, um, accessible, productive orchards. Um, and so going to um, more slimmer lime trees, I suppose, is, is one of the key things. Um, and, and new varieties. Um, new varieties is certainly what's um, saved our bacon and um, made the difference and got people motivated. Um, so yeah, th those sorts of things. But varieties is probably the leading one. So in, the, in our COVID poll just now, there, there's obviously a lot of concern in Tasmania about labour access um, moving forward. What, what's, the, and I, it sounds like New Zealand has the same concerns. What, what's happening in New Zealand to um, address this, this issue? Yeah, well, we, we've got to wait and see a little bit too. But like I said, what, we do have a surplus of labour at the moment. So we're busy over delivering on jobs. We're over pruning. Um, we're making sure we don't have too many surplus buds. We're trying to reduce our fruit thinning costs for later on. Um, and the expectation is that there will be a labor force around that may be unemployed New Zealanders more than um, uh, the backpackers or the islanders, but um, there's still time will, will tell on that one. But uh, all we can do is set our orchards up now for what's coming. Okay, um, if we've got no further questions, we might move on just to have a bit more time for the videos. Um, so before we, and also just before we move on to you, Sophie, I just wanted to highlight to everybody, Steve mentioned um, in his presentation about meeting consumer demands and sustainability and social responsibility targets and how that's changing in New Zealand and orchards taking a, a lead in this space. We recently um, had a webinar with Anthony, Anthony Kachenko and Hort Innovation uh, from Hort Innovation and Brent Clothier from Plant Food, Plant and Food in New Zealand, um, looking at the sustainability story that Hort Innovation is developing at the moment and um, how how this is working in New Zealand. So, if you're interested in that, the webinar is, has been recorded and is available on the APAL um, website in the Future Orchards Library. Okay. So just to move over to you, Sophie. So um, Sophie obviously is your frontline advisor in Tasmania and she's going to provide an update on the trials and that she's been conducting in Tasmania. Great. Thanks very much, Rose. Um, yeah, for those that don't know me um, on the webinar today, my name's Sophie Folder and I'm the Tasmanian frontline advisor for Future Orchards. Um, so many of the growers will um, understand that as part of future orchards in Tasmania or across the country, each region um, conducts two demonstration trials uh, each year. And these are trials that um, the growers, um, a group of um, what we call the community orchard group, um, which represent, is made up of representatives, growers and industry representatives within each of the regions come up with topics that they feel are relevant to them um, for their region that they would like to see addressed through practical um, um, in-orchard um, demonstration trials. So today I'm going to give a quick update as to what the trials we've been looking at in Tasmania over the last um, season and then um, yeah, finish up by talking about some of the um, trial ideas that we've got for, um, for next season. Uh, okay, so um, the two topics that our COG group uh, last, um, last year decided to investigate um, was firstly looking at um, the uh, harvest technique uh, called stem clipping um, in envy apples. Uh, this came about because uh, some of the growers growing envy apples in Tasmania have been um, having a lot of trouble with stem punctures, um, high percentages of stem punctures coming um, in their envy apples at harvest. Um, this is because of the you know long stem length and also the, um, the quite firm stem on the envy and it's also an issue in some of the other varieties like jazz um, as well. Um, 
So um, stem clipping is, is a technique that's been used in other countries. Um, I know in New Zealand, uh, there's many growers that are um, stem clipping envy. So Hanson Orchards, who are the focus orchard for um, future orchards in Tasmania, um, decided that they wanted to try that this year. Um, unfortunately, um, good old COVID, um, our best laid plans didn't work. Um, so we were yeah, planning to stem clip um, some MV apples at Hanson Orchards and compare the difference between those that had stem clipped, stem, been stem clipped after harvest and those that hadn't been. Um, but the stem clippers that have been ordered um, from New Zealand got held up with the uh, COVID postage delays and we missed the MV harvest, um, which was a real pity. So what we're doing instead is um, I'm now um, reviewing some literature um, on the topic and, um, and also talking to some growers um, who have used um, stem clipping in Envy to, to, to really gauge what are some of the, and document some of the practical tips and decision making used um, by growers when they're stem clipping their Envy apples. So um, I've spoken with a grower in Victoria who I believe might be the only um, Australian grower that's using stem clipping um, and he um, has yet yeah, trialed, trialed stem clipping for the first time this season and he's really happy to share some of the data um, from his orchard so um, I'll be collating all of that and um, we'll be present the results back from that study um, at our spring orchard walk. Um, so the second trial that we've looked at is investigating gala apple eating quality so um, in Tassie, over the last few years, we've had a real focus around apple eating quality. So we did a, a pink lady eating quality trial. And then last year, we did an envy eating quality trial, looking at um, the effect of crop load on eating quality. Um, so this trial um, is looking at um, looking at gala. Um, and we're inve investigating the effect that different um, harvest maturity, different timings of harvest, um, has on eating quality as well as the use of um, Harvista, um, so a plant ethylene um, ripening inhibitor, um, what effect that's having on the eating quality of the gala apples. So the trial's located at um, RW Squib and Sons Orchard at Sprayton. Um, so we've collected um, the apple samples at harvest. Um, so, and yeah, in March and April, and the apples are now in cool storage. So once they've come out of cool storage in the spring, we'll be doing a, a fruit taste panel of the fruit um, to see what the impacts the different um, treatments have had on final eating quality. So we do have some results um, from this trial from the, just from the fruit maturity side of things, which I'll go through now. Um, so there are kind of six treatments, um, or I suppose two treatments and three harvest dates that we've looked at in this trial. So firstly, um, the fruit that hasn't been treated with harvester. So we have an early pick, which is about a week before the commercial harvest date. Um, then we have the you know, commercial pick um, about a week, um, a week later. And then we have a late pick, which is about, um, yeah, about a week to 10 days afterwards. Um, and then we had the um, harvester um, treated fruit. Um, so as you can see there with the dates um, listed, we've actually, we staggered the dates um, according to when, uh, obviously the harvester delays, um, delays the pick date. So we um, allocated those pick dates um, according to when, um, how it related to when the commercial harvest was going to be. So you can see there those two pictures, um, the harvester treatment delayed the commercial um, harvest date by about 10 days um, in this orchard. So um, I'll just, these are some of the um, BRICS results um, from, the, from the trial. Um, so you can see there that the BRICS, um, BRICS levels increased with, as the harvest date increased, which is what we'd expect, the uh, fruits on the tree longer, um, more time for it to ripen and to accumulate sugars. Um, interestingly, the harvester treatment, treated fruit had slightly lower BRICS levels than the untreated fruit, um, at the, especially at those later harvest dates. Um, but I suppose if you look at the scale on the graph there, it is, you know, they are small they're not huge differences. Um, in regard to the starch pattern index, this is, um, yeah, we really saw a marked difference here um, 
from the, um, the harvester treatment in this fruit. So as I mentioned earlier, the um, harvester treatment, um, the harvester treated fruit ripened approximately 10 days later than the fruit that hadn't been treated with, uh, with harvester. Um, so you can see the differences in those, um, in those graphs there, um, the blue being the untreated and the orange line being the harvester treated fruit in regard to their starch pattern in index. Um, and those two pictures um, show it, you know, kind of really show the marked difference in what that looks like when you when we cut open the fruit and um, and did the starch testing. So those two pictures are taken on the same date. So um, for the untreated fruit, this was the late pick, um, and this was the date of the commercial pick for the um, harvester treated fruit. So it was um, the 26th of March. So um, you can see there, you know, a more, a more kind of overripe fruit. Um, you know, less likely to suit the kind of longer term storage in that um, untreated fruit at that date. Um, in regard to fruit firmness, um, you can see the results there that you'd expect to see that um, as the fruit's on the tree for longer, um, the fruit firmness decreases um, with those later harvest dates. So you can see that um, that late picked um, harvester treated fruit was getting quite soft by the end of the, um, end of the trial there. So in summary, the results from the trial, um, as we said, mentioned the harvester treated fruit ripened about 10 days later than the untreated fruit. Um, and this also led to an increased color palette in um, color in these in the later picked fruit. Um, the fruit firmness reduced as the harvest date increased. Um, the untreated fruit had slightly higher BRICS levels than the harvester treated fruit. Um, I'm not quite sure why that would be the case. Um, something you might look into. Um, further and um, and as I mentioned earlier there'll be an eating quality trial in the spring um, of 2020 um, it, depending on what the plans are for the spring orchard walk we might be able to do the, uh, the taste panel uh, uh, in association with that orchard walk um, and we will assess the impact of these maturity differences on the eat, apple eating quality so we'll look at things like um, you know the flavor the juiciness the um, texture of the apple and you know would I purchase that piece of fruit again and uh, our previous uh, eating quality trials that we've done over the last two seasons have um, yeah shown this to be a really great activity and we really have been able to find um, significant differences between um, between different treatments um, through this apple um, through the taste panel assessment so the, uh, the last um, slide I'll bring up today is just um, we, the community, Tasmanian Community Orchard Group met last week where we um, went through and raised some topics being considered for trials for, for this next coming season. Um, we had to think because of the way um, Future Orchards is contracted, we, um, yeah, the kind of current contract for Future Orchards is running out at the end of March. So we had to really focus on, on topics that we could kind of um, address in kind of the, the first part of the season. So we kind of had, unfortunately, had to avoid kind of harvest related trials. Um, so the topics that they've kind of come up with, uh, uh, looking at apple re like an apple replant trial, comparing lots of different root stocks um, and what impact that will have on um, apple replant disease and, and um, tree growth. Um, a blossom thinning trial, so comparing different ways of blossom thinning. Um, it's been suggested that we look at the Darwin thinner, hand thinning, and um, compare that to commercial thinning programs. And then also the third topic was um, looking at the cost effectiveness of hand thinning at different times after full bloom. So, um, you know, if we go in early, obviously the fruit's smaller, it's probably a little bit more difficult to um, thin. If we wait a week or two and thin when the fruit's a little bit bigger, um, does that make it easier for the picker and, and therefore um, more efficient and more cost effective? So um, yeah, three different trial ideas there. Um, we'll select two of those trials um, that we'll actually take through, two of those ideas that we'll actually then take through to trials. So that's all I had today and thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much, Sophie. Um, there's just a quick comment from Kevin. Dodds. Um, so he mentions that the sugar difference between the untreated and harvester treatment could just be due to a greater proportion of starch conversion in the untreated fruit. Would, do you have any comments about, about that? Um, no, I'm happy to take Kevin's um, thoughts on that one. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> Those are all the questions that we've got. Um, so 
if anyone has any comments on the trials that Sophie's currently doing or any feedback on the proposed trials, please get in touch with Sophie. And in the interests of Zoom exposure and time, we're now going to move on to the um, New Zealand. We're going to head over to New Zealand to have a look through some orchards with Ross and Steve. And so it's over to you, um, Steve, I think. Ross. Yes, so I've, I've um, produced two videos um, so far. One is of a fruiting wall um, in Machuaika, uh, which was converting an existing orchard five by three rural gala into a fruiting wall. Um, certainly not ideal um, in regard that um, you know, pulling pulling the trees out and redeveloping it would have been better longer term, but this met the growers' needs uh, and offered a lot of advantages. But if you watch the video, it's on the APL website there, along with these other ones, um, you'll get a good background as to what's going on. It's only five minutes, it's a pretty short one. But this other video here is of a 2D um, fruiting system that uh, Hottie's Orchards, Hottie's Fruit Company have been um, using in Nelson for 15 years. Um, and uh, Kevin's done a really good job of presenting and outlining exactly how that all works. So I'll leave it up to the video. Uh, so um, I'm here today with Kevin Witherton from Hotties Fruit Company. Yep, yep. So Kevin, just explain a bit about your role and what you do and a bit about the 2D system here. So I run all the spray programs of uh, plant health and protection uh, and heavily involved with the, the um, management uh, team um, coming up with what we do sort of day to day really. Um, the 2D system that we're growing uh, here we're about 15 years in now I think yep. um, and so yeah it's been a natural sort of progression. Um, you know, so it's basically an eight wire system, um, planting entities 2.5 metres wide in the row and about 1.2 between trees, 1.2 metres. And then we have our eight wires sort of running up, up uh, as an Australia sort of system. Uh, and we basically just train the branches onto the wires and um, that, that keeps our windows open for light. And then, yeah, we just um, come up with a number between trees of what we think those um, that area should handle for our crop loading. So what variety have we got on here? So we've got Royal Gala here yep. today. Yep. Um, so yeah, and like for pruning at the moment we're targeting 25 to 30 buds between uh, trunks. Yep. So per wire, and that's the equivalent of a tree. Yep. So if we match from there to there, then yep. that's, there is a bit of variability obviously, yep. but um, that's how that works. So yep. when we're trying to come up with, um, you know, how we prune it, we're just trying to sort of favour our, our spur units with these short little darts that have a nice uh, fat terminal bud on the end. Um, trying to work through a bit of hand spacing yep. and just trying to favour the uh, buds and material coming out the sides of the branches. Yep. Um, so we have our bud number there and then within that we just have a few sort of specific rules as in trying to keep the pencil thickness where we can for the thickness of the wood so that um, it's strong enough to, to hold the fruit. Um, and also height and width um, restrictions around how long we leave the units. Yep. Um, so as an example that one there, it's it's more than a secateur length, which is what we try and use. It's something that we've got on us. And um, so then I'll just remove that one off the side and favour the, the outward facing one. Sometimes we trim things back a little bit in, in preparation for the next year, so it might not be very good for cropping this year, yep. um, but that'll give up, cover our bases for next year. And how we've achieved these is just basically by tipping um, a lot of the annual growths. You know, once upon a time that would have been a, a, a lateral shoot there, yep. just a one year piece, and we've just tipped it. Yep. And then that makes them push out a wee bit and spur up into yep. to what we want. What rootstock are these on? 
Um, got a mixture. I think they're mostly M9s. M9s. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So they're relatively quiet. Do you regardless at all? Do you yep. hold the bigger yep. bit? Yeah. Plenty of regardless. Yep. A couple yep. of applications of that. Yep. Summer um, prune as well. Uh, not a lot. We used to do quite a bit of summer pruning, but we um, find we don't really need to. Yeah. Yep. Um, they, they crop so heavily, it's, it's in excess of 80, 90 tonnes yep. every year. Yep. And some of the other varieties, certainly all of that and, and more. Um, what do you find are the pluses of this 2D system? The biggest sort of benefits the fruit quality, I think. Yep. Um, you know, the, the size distribution is generally a lot more even than um, sort of other, other growing systems. systems. Yep. Um, and yeah, just more uniformity. Pick out virtually every apple, yep. so the lighting section is really good. Yep. Um, good. Good dry matter and fruit quality, and good colour and size. Basics, really. So, with your 25 buds between there to there, how many fruit would you expect to pick? Uh, it's about 20. Yep. Yep. So, 20 times our requires is 160 apples, and yep. then we have our extra units that yep. come off the trunk here and there. Yep. Um, and so I think 180 fruits you know, fill up there yep. in, in tonnage, so um, yeah, around it. Okay. Have you found any um, negatives from the system that you've been using? Anything that you do again or do differently? No. no. So I, th I think we, yeah, yep. we, we've looked at other systems as well and we, we like what we're doing with the, the 2D and it's working well for us, so we're... When you've got to understand it, yeah, know it now, yeah. so it's second nature. Yeah. Yep, yep, works um, for you. Now it's, you just, it's really easy to train people as well because yep. you just you give a number there and then you sort of, yep. it's easy to count and monitor and, yes, and all yep. the things yep. are, are much sort of easier. Do you run long branches long or are you shortening them up? Is that the norm now? Or? Uh, it's a bit of both. Yep. It depends on sort of the, the vigour of the tree a wee bit too. Yep. Um, and what, what you've got to cut to, but generally a bit of a gap in the middle is, is good. Yep. Um, but yeah, depending on, on the age of the branch and that. Yep. Um, yeah. So. so if you just prune that one there, that side so done pretty it, easy yeah. that one there. We just, yeah. just work our way along. So just you're eliminating that. buds and weak wood. Yep, correct. Yep. Just coming back into them. That might be one that I'd leave alone yep. or, or just give it a wee shorten. Yep. That's, that's basically it for that one. And if I do a quick count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. 23, 24. Yeah. And often we'll, you know, depending on branch size, we might end up with 15 buds if yep. it's not a full yep. wire. Uh, and up the top, uh, quite often I end up at about 30, 32. Yep. Just trying to hang a little bit more bud up there where the vigour is at the top of the tree. Yep. Uh, just to keep the charm, really. Uh, and, and the bottoms are definitely a lot sort of weaker than the as with any other system as well. So. Uh, our last video for the day uh, is actually my own orchard. So I very much have my grower hat on and um, we've got a little bit of time today before we finish off. It's a 10 minute video, five minutes for questions. We'd love to see uh, some of the people that are online posting the odd questions. So um, there's a challenge for you. It'd be nice to end on a high note with a little bit of feedback. So let's have a look what's happening on my orchard. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Ross Wilson, uh, and many of you will already know me as a consultant with AdFirst. But um, today I've got my, well, I haven't got my grower hat on, actually, I've got my ad first hat on. But I'm special to you as the grower. Uh, so we've got an orchard as well, 20 hectares planted, it's all apples. And as you'll see, as Jack scans around, we've got a, uh, a range of plantings on our orchard, ranging from very old stuff over here on the right, um, right through to some, um, some twin stem intensive trees.
Uh, anyway, um, uh, the reason for this video is to focus in on one block of trees on Sun Peach Orchard. It's a block of envy. Uh, been in the ground two and a half years. They've just completed their third leaf. Um, and we reckon it's a pretty stunning block. It's a, it's a twin stem block, as you can see. Uh, each tree was planted with two stems from the nursery. That was, a, that was critical. Um, it's a three metre wide row spacing. And that's all designed because we, we want to bring down the size of our trees even further. We don't want them, we don't want them overly tall. Uh, we want them narrow, so we've brought the row spacing into three metres. The tree spacing in the row is 1.5 metres. And with the twin stem, it means each stem is 75 centimetres apart. I haven't got the numbers straight off the top of my head, but it's something like 2,200 trees per hectare, but it's actually 4,400 stems per hectare. Isn't that, uh, we're very fortunate this particular land is virgin land. Got to make that clear. That's one of the reasons it's performed so well. Um, but we really looked after the trees in year one. You know, and we think we got the water right. We, uh, uh, you know, we used a little bit of GA3 to promote growth. I mean, all the, all the basic things. We also kept a very tight powdery mildew program. Okay, so uh, you get your spacing right and you've got the variety right. One, one of the good things about Envy, of course, you all know it, it grows a very big apple, uh, as you can see. Um, so, um, you know, this, this last year, 300 gram apple, so you don't need too many of them. Uh, you you don't, certainly don't need as many of these as you do other varieties to get tonnage. But anyway, uh, this might blow a few people away, but it just shows you the potential. Uh, in the second leaf, the second leaf, 18 months after planting, this block uh, produced 40 tonne to the hectare. Uh, and in the third leaf, just gone, uh, 82 tonnes per hectare. At about an 82% class one pack out, a 300 gram average fruit size, which is right in the slot for envy, and also 70% uh, high grade colour. So fantastic fruit quality as well as a great volume. Anyway, this year, 80 tonnes last year, we think it's got the capability this year, if you look at the canopy, uh, to do uh, about the 100 tonnes. 100 tonnes a hectare, another 20 tonnes more, not a huge increase. Um, 100 tonnes per hectare works out at 80 pieces of fruit per stem. That's assuming a 280 gram average piece, which Envy's capable of doing. So um, 80 pieces of fruit per stem, then the question becomes how many of these buds do we need to leave in the tree? With a tree of this age with still a lot of uh, one year wood in it, um, I think I'd be happy with it being somewhere around 1.5 to 1.7 buds per fruit. So that's what we're targeting. Now we've got to try and prune the trees uh, to get the best buds that we can in the tree to grow the best possible fruit. So now we'll have a go at, um, at doing some pruning. What we've identified in this flock is the tops of the trees uh, really doing really nice quite naturally so there's very little that we have to take out of the top um, all we'll be doing in the top is identifying the branches that are too steep that are unlikely to come over with fruit weight that's a branch there that's very steep unlikely to come over with fruit weight so we'll be we'll be removing that this is the sort of branching in the top that we're trying to encourage this nice flat branching in the tops, we're largely removing the very steep branches, um, and that's largely going to be it. Our biggest issue this year is in the bottoms of these trees. And in, in this particular tree, there are a lot of branches in the bottom of the tree. We believe we've just, we've just got too much clutter in this part of the tree that light environment's not good enough and we've got to open this up. So when we, when we look at this tree, uh, the decisions we've got to make is of, of this clutter of branches here, you know, if we're going to remove some and get some better spacing, which one is the best one to remove? Now remember, this is at a tight row spacing. It's only three meters apart and it's only 0.75. So we're looking to carry the smaller wood, not the bigger wood. And you'll notice that this piece of wood here 
quite a vigorous piece of wood. It's had to have been shortened up. Uh, this cut was done last season to actually enable tractor access. Now, if we leave that piece of wood in, the vigor on the end of this branch is just going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. So I'm much better in to leave these weaker units. Uh, so this cut, that one there for me, is a remover. Now, if I look further in this branch, I've got um, I've got a reasonable branch here. These are all quite high quality branches. Um, and this one here, if you see it, this one is very, very pendant and become very, uh, very weak. And there's a better branch sitting over the top. So I'm going to remove that little pendant one. Um, the same with that little pendant one in there. You know, that sort of fruit on a very pendant branch like that's not going to be very good. So I'm removing the very, very strong one and the very, very weak ones. I'm tending to leave the branches that are the sort of middle caliper and they're all in their own space. And then, um, then, you, then I've got to make a decision. I've got to be able to tell my pruner is having one, two, three branches in the same place uh, too much? And, and is that going to enable me to color the fruit on that particular branch? Um, I'm going to leave that decision until the very end because that's getting down to the marginal stuff. Um, this, is a quite a, this is quite a good branch. The other rule that I want to give my pruners is um, remove the large 12 o'clock shoots, the upright shoots, and also remove the, um, the, the shoots underneath. That's on the branch. So here we have a nice branch with nice fruiting buds on it. What I want the pruner to do is to remove the 12 o'clock shoots off that and and um, in that case I'm happy with that branch now as it is. Here in the upper tree I've got, I also have a rule that we've had no more than one branch coming out of the leader at one place. So here's a classic where they're all pieces of one-year-old wood all come from a cut. I'll remove the steep ones and leave the flat one. And this being envy, you'd be surprised, put three apples on that each at 280 or 300 grams, that, that will roll down into that position next season. That's too steep, leave a little arm, and that's too steep, right? So they both come out, here we have, here's the branch, two uprights on the branch, both the uprights come off, and I leave the side little dart shoots here with a nice big terminal bud on the side, that's the ones that I want to leave. So now, that's a nice branch. Now on that side of the tree, um, if I look if I look down at the bottom, I've left this little weak one here. I probably, you know, this is getting close to the ground, do a little shortening cut on that. Um, there's a 12 o'clock here. And on that side of the tree, I'm, uh, I'm now pretty happy. Okay, we're just uh, now scanning down a bay of pruned trees. Uh, we've done some counts. We're sitting at about 1.5 to 1.7 buds per fruit, uh, which is a ratio that we're happy with. Didn't, wouldn't want to go any harder than that. Um, and you'll see we've achieved what we set out to, to achieve. Uh, every branch in its own space, uh, good access, um, and high quality buds throughout the whole tree. That's um, great, Ross. We've got a few questions coming in too, which is even better. So, <laughs> so Ross, um, Brett's asked, if you're aiming for 100 tonnes in year three, where do you see the crop at full production? Um, well, with Envy, Brett, I think uh, you're an Envy grower too. And, and like a lot of varieties, you've got to find the sweet spot that gives you maximum class one yield, but also gives you those fruit quality parameters that the market uh, really demands. And, and for us, it's about getting uh, that very good colour uh, and also, um, you know, being able to pick it at a good maturity. So when we, if we risk overcropping, those are the two things that go first, which we can't afford to do. Um, now, I really think that crops are capable of 100 tonne this year, uh, and I would see it peaking out at about 120 tonnes per hectare 
um, if we can get it nice and consistent. So um, that's answering that question. The other question that uh, Brett's raised is when a cut is being made against the trunk, do we use a bench cutting technique or a toilet sut, leaving a little snig uh, to encourage further branching? And yes, we absolutely do. Um, but being very careful, we don't. We only do it where we want another branch to come. But we're finding in our dwarf trees, if we don't do that, we're often not getting enough replacement wood coming. So um, quite a quite a good technique to do. And because uh, originally when I took that video, we had 20 minutes of coverage, uh, and we cut it right back to 10. That was one thing we were we showed as well was that that technique. But great questions, thank you, Brett. Um, Ross, I've got a question. You mentioned that you were planting one of the blocks on virgin soil, um, which obviously not everybody has the luxury of doing. And what, what kind of results would you have expected if you hadn't planted on virgin soil or what kind of preparation would you have done if that wasn't the case? <laughs> well, I actually have, uh, it's interesting on that block, there is an area that's, um, that's non-virgin soil and, and most of it is virgin soil. Look, you know, we sterilize everything because if we don't sterilize, the growth that we get in a replant site is just pathetic. Uh, and the sterilization does help, but it's never as good as planting virgin land. It's, it's, you know, I suspect that if that block was planted on replant land with a good sterilization program, my yield, my yield achievements would be about 50% of what I've achieved on virgin land. So that would be in year two, 20 tonnes per hectare, not 40. And in year three, 40 tonnes per hectare, not 80. Uh, so the virgin land is giving a real advantage at getting those trees and that canopy established. Um, uh, that's why all the big investors these days, in our land anyway, they're all looking for virgin land because it, it makes such a big difference. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. Um, okay, so we don't have any other questions coming up, but we had a good question yesterday, which was both, both to you and Steve, uh, um, about if you um, had a block, what would what system would you replant with? What would be your favourite system? And I thought that was a, that's a good way to end um, today. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Steve and I have both got different opinions, and, and that's what happens. Every grower's got their own preference, and and I love to see the diversity, actually. Uh, and, and the message is you can grow apples in multiple different ways. For me, I've agonised over this. And you would have seen an EcoV trellis in the, in the initial, you know, so it just shows you I'm, I'm not doing everything the same. There's some reasons for that. I won't go into it. But if I've got, I've got a bit of bare land that I'm planting, uh, for me, for my money, I'm preferring an upright system. I prefer a narrow system, so hence coming into three, but I like the three-dimensional tree that allows the branches to come naturally. I don't, personally, I'm not into heavy tree manipulation that the formal 2D systems uh, require. In saying that, if a robotic harvester comes around next year and it's cost-effective, we'll all be going 2D. Uh, so um, that's my opinion. Well done, Ross. Sit on the fence well. <laughs> um, having been in Washington and seen the uh, V system over there, it's very impressive. And, and the take home message that I got was the system is very easy for staff to implement um, training and pruning techniques. The issue is that the person driving it needs to be very clever and very switched on. Um, and that's a bit like most systems. So I, I just like the opportunity that it will increase yield. Um, and we have one or two growers down our way going into it, and it's looking really good. It, all systems have their hang-ups, all systems have their advantages, um, and everyone who's working on them has to get their head around it. So I, I'm not too worried, but yeah, I certainly prefer the V system from what I've seen. Okay. Um, so before we finish up, Ross, Steve, Sophie, or Nigel, do you have any other comments that you'd like to make? Otherwise, we'll um, finish up for the day. So, uh, yeah, I just had a quick one, um, Rose, just to Ross. Um, Ross had some good comments about those BRICS levels um, and the fruit firmness in the um, TAS um, gala trial that I just thought you might like to share them with the broader group, Ross. Yeah, I think when, um, when Sophie does the final analysis of that trial, I mean, the, the thing that struck me was the fruit pressure 
that was achieved on those Tasmanian gala. Uh, look, New Zealand growers would dream to have fruit pressure that you were recording there. I think they were all over 10 kilos, mm. uh, which is phenomenally good pressure for a gala. Even on your latest har har harvest pick, that was, that was great pressure fruit. Uh, so that's the first point I'd like to make. And I, I really don't think probably the BRICS uh, difference was probably significant. It might be what Kevin pointed out just the difference of what the starch pattern index was at the time. But, but the big point that growers have got to understand with a tool like Harvista, it's great from a harvest management perspective. What say that, that, that group of backpackers that you're expecting is just not there in early March and you need to shift a crop to late March. That's what it's good for. But think about what another 10 days on the tree does for your fruit size and fruit yield. It's very, very significant. So a couple of big pluses there that, that, that when you're looking at Harvista as a tool, you need to take into account. Thanks, Ross. Okay. Thanks very much, Ross, and thanks, Sophie. Um, that's all we've got time for today. Nigel's men mentioned that the sun is coming out in Tasmania for the first time in a few days, so we'll let you get out there. If you've got anything else that you'd like to discuss with today's speakers, please follow up with them directly or contact us at APAL and we can put you in touch with them. I'd like to thank Nigel, Steve, Ross and Sophie for sharing your experiences and your research and your orchards. And I'd also like to thank Larissa Vaughan, whom you haven't seen on the screen, but she's in the background making sure that everything runs smoothly and we don't run into any trouble. <laughs> You can find today's presentations and videos in the Future Orchards Library on the APAL website. A recording of today's session should be up in a few days. If the videos that you saw weren't totally clear, they're also up on the APAL website and AgFest have rec recorded or will record a total of six videos that will all be up on the APAL website. If they're not there already, some of them are and the others will be up shortly. And to you out there, thanks all very much for participating. We know it's not the usual way to run an orchard walk, but we hope um, it's been useful for you. We'll be conducting a short evaluation at the end of this session as you exit. You'll see a small pop-up box directing you to an online survey, and we'd appreciate if you can take a few minutes to complete that because we value your feedback. I'd also like to acknowledge Hort Innovation as this Future Orchards sure. program is funded by the Apple and Pear R&D levy and contributions from the Australian government that are managed by Hort Innovation. APEL has more webinars coming up over the next few months. And you can see a summary of those here and find more information on those on the APEL website. And you can register for those uh, webinars just like you registered for this Orchard Walk. If you have anything else that you're particularly interested in, please let us know. In the meantime, stay healthy and we look forward to seeing you at one of the upcoming webinars or the next Future Orchards Walk, which hopefully will be in person. Thanks very much. See you later. Hey, everyone. Bye.